mechanical, uh, my mechanical digestion includes mastication, that's chewing, then we have duplication, and then we have peristaltic activity. So that is the rhythmic movement, squeezing action, churning action of the intestines and the stomach, okay? So the stomach is going to produce what's known as uh, chyme. It's a semi-fluid mouth, I'm sorry, not the stomach, but your mouth, as you're chewing, and your stomach, I'm sorry, produces chyme, which gets the food ready to be digested. Again, through rhythmic segmentation, the squeezing and the, and the churning, will move the products through the digestive system, and it remains two to six hours in the stomach, and then about three to five hours through the small intestine. Uh, through chemical digestion, you have enzymes from the glands, your stomach, and your small bowel and pancreas, as well as the bile that aids in the breaking down process of the contents. So we talked about body habitus with the stomach, just like uh, in the uh, gallbladder. Depending on the size of the patient, will also determine the position of the uh, of the stomach. So with those who are hypersthenic, it pushes everything up and out. Average size patient kind of has a angular position to it, and then your hyposthenic and your asthenic is a elongated J shape. Now, what happens here is that if you're asthenic, even if you're approaching hyposthenic to asthenic, it's not uncommon that you will find the stomach sitting around the pelvic region. Okay? So it's not uncommon to find that. So, in looking at these images that we have here, we said hypersthenic pushes everything up. Okay, sthenic kind of has the same, uh, kind of the J shape here, but now we have asthenic, very long, okay, elongated. Most of the stomach here is located at the level of T11 and T12. Here, sthenic is going to be about L2. So, what that means here is L1, L2 usually around the level of the elbow. If you're hypersthenic, your, your stomach is gonna be a little bit higher, so now you're gonna go about one to two inches above the elbow. Asthenic, am I gonna have my image receptor this way or this way? That way. Okay, so now for here, we're doing it like this. We're doing it like this. Now for asthenic, we have to orient, orient our image receptor the other way and more towards the left. Because notice here, this is going across the abdomen, yes? Although it's on the left side, it's still going across the abdomen. On the left, okay, across the abdomen. Here, all on the left, okay? Level of L2. Stenic. Stenic, good. Asthenic. L3, L4. L3, L4. T11, T12. Hypersthenic. Hypersthenic, okay. And you also see how it's going across. Yeah, okay, that was hypersthenic, okay. Contrast media. Okay, we need contrast, right? Stomach is a soft, soft tissue. You can't see it. It's just gonna be gray and washed out. So now we need to introduce contrast material that has the same properties of that of bone. So, we have barium. Barium is a suspension colloid. Barium is a metal. You guys know that? Barium is a metal. Where do we get barium? At the market? In the barium store? <laughs> barium mines. We actually have to go to mines to get the barium. Did you know that a couple years before you guys started the program, our students rarely saw any fluoroscopic studies because there was a barium shortage in the hospitals. Yeah, there was a barium shortage. So uh, there was something going on in Africa where they got most of the barium and uh, they were not exporting it to our country for some reason or another. I don't know the whole story, but we had a major shortage. So there were rarely any type of fluoroscopic studies and there were rarely any type of CT studies because of the lack of barium. So they had to figure out alternates to get the, 
to do to get some kind of similar diagnosis on the patient. All right, so contrast comes in all different, the same form, but they come in different thicknesses. They can come as thin as a milkshake or they can be as thick as cooked cereal. It all depends on the preference of the doctors and what they're trying to rule out. So when you start doing these barium studies, you will find out that there are different <coughs> consistencies and thicknesses of these barium. Okay, what else do we know about barium? Have you guys ever tried it before? It's thick, it's chalky, it's nasty, it's gritty. <laughs> you tried it? Well, this is yeah. Well, guess what? You guys are gonna get to taste it. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. <laughs> Because thickness? you get points for it, no, you don't. <laughs> but they come in different flavors too. So when they come in vanilla, vanilla. chocolate, chocolate. Oh, really? pina colada, <laughs> pancake, pancake. <laughs> but I, I hear they come in different flavors. The only ones that I've tried was banana flavor and it was strawberry. Which one tasted better? Strawberry uh, banana. Banana. <laughs> banana is good. Yeah, when yeah, I was a, good. again, was, yeah, this was <laughs> when I was a CT tech. Yeah. So um, they come thin, they come thick. When you're doing an upper GI, an upper GI is generally done as a double contrast study. What does that mean, double contrast? Two types. <laughs> okay, what are the contrasts? We've got iodine. Okay. okay. Air is the other one. Okay. So it's either going to be, it's going to be barium and it's going to be air. Why you would do a double contrast? It's to better visualize. Remember those mucosal folds in the stomach? What is that called? Rouge. The rouge. The double contrast studies better visualizes the rouge in the stomach. Okay? Greater than 90% of your upper GI procedures will be done double contrast. So how is air introduced? CPR? <laughs> mouth to mouth? Okay. The, the intubatum or no? Okay. This is what's going to happen. Okay. Your dialogue is now going to get more and more complex when you're doing fluoroscopic studies. Okay. It's not as simple as, you know, take everything from the waist up, go dress, shoot an x ray. Now, what's going to happen here is you're going to get your patient dressed. You're going to have them come into your department. This is the way an upper GI works. Remove everything from the waist up because what are we, what are we looking at here? We're looking at from here to here, right? Mm -hmm. So everything from the waist up, what else are we getting rid of? Earrings. Earrings, jewelry. hair, jewelry, anything. Okay, because we're looking from here to here. We get them on the table, we're gonna tell them exactly what's gonna happen. So the, the things that, we're, first of all, what we're gonna do is, in any of your fluoroscopic studies, the first thing that you gotta do is you're gonna shoot a KUB. You guys writing this down? Okay. That is going to be the very, very first radiograph you're going to take is a KUB. You guys know what that's called? Preliminary. It's called scalp. a scalp film. You guys heard that, right? <coughs> it's called a scalp. You say, hey, Joe, go shoot a scalp film on that upper GI. Hey, Kim, go shoot a scalp film on that esophagus. Okay. For an esophagus, the scalp film is a chest x-ray. The scalp film for an upper GI, lower GI, anything here is going to be what? K it's going to be a KUB. What is the whole purpose of the scalp films? To see what they Okay. Well, first we want to make sure that the patient has been prepped properly. Okay. Make sure, making sure that they followed the prep the night before having this procedure done. Okay. Making sure that there isn't any type of contents in there. That they did pro follow the proper protocol of being NPO. Because any contents in their system will look like a mass. So we want to get rid of all that and make sure that they're prepped by taking a KUB or, in this, or a chest x-ray. The other thing about taking a scout is making sure that there isn't anything there that will be covered with barium because when you do barium, everything becomes opaque. And if there was something there before, we wouldn't know because how do we know? Because that's why we take a scalp film. We need to know if something was there before they ingested the contrast. So that's the whole purpose. We're looking for anomalies before 
the intake any type of contrast media. Does that make sense? Okay. So in any fluoroscopic exams, you need to do a scalp film first. <coughs> now, going back to the upper GI, okay, because we'll talk about this again later on. How we introduce gas is Miss Jones, so I do my history, okay, and then I, I'll just jump right into the procedure after I do the scalp film. Okay, Miss Jones, this is what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be doing an upper GI study. We're gonna be evaluating your esophagus and also looking at your stomach. During the procedure, you're gonna be laying down in different positions, okay? In a fluoroscopic study, the doctor is gonna come in to do the first portion of it. The patient will be in an upright position. They usually start in an upright position with the table standing up. Then they'll lay the patient down and the patient will lay on their right side, on their belly, on their back, on their left side. REO, LPL, they'll be laying down in different positions during the fluoroscopic study. Now you guys know what fluoroscopy is, right? Now, before we start that, Ms. Jones, I'm gonna give you a couple of things to drink, okay? First one here is gas crystals. It's effervescent. Do you guys know what Alka-Seltzer is? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's kind of like Alka-Seltzer. They're gas crystals. Okay, they come in a little packet. We put it in a shot glass for them. And in the other shot glass, I'm gonna have some contrast. Miss Jones, I'm gonna need you to put this, uh, I'm gonna need you to take this gas crystal, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna throw it in the back of your throat, okay? And here's the contrast, we're gonna need you to want you to drink it right after you take those gas crystals. Depending on the policy or protocol of your hospital, they may also allow you to have the patient drink a small <coughs> shot of water to help some of that stuff go down. Naturally, what's gonna happen is those gas crystals are gonna go down your esophagus and start to bubble up in your stomach. What is the first thing that you wanna do? Burp. Burp. You're gonna to wanna to burp, okay? Uh. Right? You tell your patient you're gonna feel like you're gonna to wanna to burp, don't. Because we want that air in the stomach. And if they burp, guess what you have to do? Again. There you go, here's another one for you, okay? The crystals aren't actually that bad, they kinda of taste like 7-Up. Some of them taste like seven ounces, it's not that bad. What's bad is the contrast that you have to, that they have to drink because it's again very thick and very chalky. So once they do this and do that, then we'll lay them on the table, okay, and we'll tell them to lay on their back for about 20 seconds, lay on your side about 20 seconds, lay on your belly 20 seconds until they do a full rotation. Because what are we doing now? We're coating up the stomach. Okay, so we coat them up. <laughs> Then we get on the phone and we call the doctor in and say, okay, I'm ready for you. That's kind of the first part of it, okay? There's a little bit more that's in the ball, but this is where the gas crystals come in. It's introduced by those effervescent gas, gas crystals, and I'll, sh I'll probably give you guys that next week. Not that bad. Wait, what? To take? <laughs> you get to sample it. No. <laughs> There's no no in this class. <laughs> okay. Water soluble. We have bearing, we also have water soluble. What's water soluble? We talked about it earlier. That's the iodine contrast, okay? That's the gastrographin or the gastro view. We use water soluble if there is some sort of perforation in the system, because if there is a perforation in the esophagus or the stomach and that contrast sticks out into the cavity, there's no getting rid of it, because it's a metal suspension, right? It, your body's not gonna absorb it. So now you can, can, you can have intestinal infarct as well as peritonitis. You can't get rid of it. If there is any suspect of any perforation or blockage, we give them iodine because if it has nowhere to go, what's gonna happen? Your body absorbs it, and then where does it go after that? You pee it out. You just, you just pee it out, okay? All right. You do the procedure, then you have your post-exam instructions. Your post-exam uh, instructions sound something like this, okay? Miss Jones, in the next couple of days, you may notice a change in the color of your stool. It may look white, okay? What I'd like you to do for the next couple of days is drink plenty of fluids. Drinks lots of water. What do you like to drink, Miss Jones? You like water, you like juice, you like beer? Drink lots of it, okay? Drink lots of it, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to flush it out. 
if you get any type of abdominal pains or you get constipated, okay, first to do constipated, take a mild laxative. If you have constipation and that persists, if you have any type of abdominal pains that persists, contact your doctor immediately. So that's part of your dialogue now, okay? All right, so here's your barium. Mimics that of bone. Very thick, has a high atomic number of approximately 56. Is that a random number I just picked up? Okay. 56, it has a very high atomic number, 56. Iodine has 53. Okay. So which of the two is better for radiographically? Iodine. 56 or 53? Oh, 56. 56, it's more solid. So that's another reason, you know, these are one of the pros and cons. Pros of using gastrographin iodinated contrast is good because if the patient has any type of obstruction or perforation, okay, body absorbs it, you pee it out, okay? But the downfall to gastrographin is because it has a lower atomic number, visually, it doesn't look good. So that's the downside to that. All right, so you have these different types of, um, they're all barium, it's metal, it's colloid. You have to make sure that when you are giving barium contrast to your patient, you have to shake up that bottle. Okay, make sure that suspension is mixed up nicely. Okay, because if you wait a while, everything settles down to the bottom. Okay. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> so here's your water, water soluble iodinated contrast media. Again, we use that instead of barium if there is a perforated viscous. Also, if they're going in for surgery, why, why is that a, a significance? Let's just say they had the study done today. They're going to have surgery tomorrow. Will that be okay? No. Well, yeah. For this, okay, yeah. If I gave them barium, and they had surgery tomorrow, the barium will still be in them, right? So this is why we would use gastrographin, because if we gave them barium, now you have to wait three or four days down the line until they're completely empty. And then you gotta come back to make sure that they're completely empty by taking more x-rays. Gastrographin, at least you know it's gone, yes? Is this an MPO procedure? Is this an MPO procedure? Uh, this, this one, no. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna get to the specifics later on. I was just doing a generality, okay? All right, contraindications. Okay, if you have hypersensitivity to iodine, it's a, a school of thought. Some doctors say hypersensitivity to iodine has nothing to do with it. Then you have some doctors that will say it does have something to do with it, okay? So whatever the doctor tells you. Severe dehydration. If the patient is, uh, is having severe dehydration, it usually happens with the elderly and the young, you don't want to give this because it is a diuretic. It sucks all the fluids out of your cells and, you know, diuretic, it's like mm -hmm. beer. So that's a diuretic. That's why you go into the bathroom constantly because it's putting fluids out of your, the, the cellular chambers and you're peeing everything out. So this acts as a diuretic it'll cause more dehydration and can cause major complications. Okay? Was there a question? Okay. Esophagram. So the purpose of the esophagram is to study the form and function of the swallowing aspects of the pharynx and esophagus. Indications include anatomical anomalies, impaired swallowing mechanism, location of foreign bodies, reflux, and also varices. Varices is a type of varicose veins of the esophagus. Contraindications include fossil uh, sensitivity. Make sure that you have good patient history, and this is gonna require a pleural setup. Patient will be, during the procedure, in an upright position with a cup in the left hand. So again, the contrast <coughs> of choice is barium, and it depends on the doctor if they like to use thin barium or thick barium. Thin barium goes through the system rather quickly. 
Thick bearing goes down a little bit slower and you get better visualization of the structure. So again, it depends on the doctor. So this is what a normal esophagus looks like. Is there something wrong with this image? Where's the stomach? Where should the stomach be? On the other side. On the other side. Okay. So would you think this image was flipped? It, it was flipped. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with this patient. Now, don't be surprised. I'm bringing this up because don't be surprised when you do, when you're doing an upper GI or if you're doing a barium enema, and all the organs are flipped over. You have patients like you have individuals like that. Chest x-rays chest x-rays next to cardia, the heart is the opposite way. The apex of the heart is on this side. Yeah. Yeah. So it happens once in a while. So your eyes are not playing tricks on you. They're actually backwards inside. Okay. Um, some terms here, aplasia. Aplasia is uh, damaged esophageal nerves. So your esophagus has nerves that help push the contents down the pipe into your stomach, and this is lack of function of those nerves. So that's aplasia. Cardiospasm, okay, causes strictures. Es esophagitis, inflammation of the esophagus. Carcinoma, what's carcinoma? Cancer. Okay, good. Then we have a Barrett's esophagus where the distal esophagus demonstrates a stricture or ulceration. That's Barrett's. Now Barrett's, again, the key here is that it occurs at the distal esophagus. Okay, distal esophagus. Okay, this is a Zenker's diverticulum. A diverticula or diverticulum is a, an outpouching. It applies to any intestinal, uh, intestinal um, part. So it's an outpouching. It's a diverticulum. Okay. This again usually usually happens also at the distal <coughs> esophagus. It can happen anywhere in the esophagus, but usually at the distal. Here is this distal. What are we looking at here? That's your, your cervical spine, right? So that's around here. Yeah. Okay. Um, rule out foreign body. I don't know the history of this, so I still don't know what this is. I mean, I, I don't think it's a fish bone. It looks like <laughs> the end of an earring or something, maybe? Pictures. Okay. See the cobblestone looking thing like there? Mm -hmm. This is your varices. This is your varicose veins of the esophagus. Usually, uh, patients, uh, individuals who have varices, there's something going on with their, their liver. When the liver isn't function properly, it, um, it diminishes, I'm sorry, it increases the pressure in the portal vein, causing all this back pressure into the esophagus, causing the veins there to get dilated and twisted, varicose veins. So it has to do with the increased pressure from the, of the portal vein in the, the liver. This is most common that you see with alcoholics, most common. Okay, small bowel as an esophagus, can I see that? Does that look like an esophagus? Look at, look at how it looks. Does that look like small bowel? Mm -hmm. So, actually we do have a case study on, on this. This is one of the case studies that I was gonna have you guys do. But something happened to the esophagus. Could have been from, it could be from cancer. I don't know the background history. It could have been from cancer. It could be from an attempt at suicide where they were drinking Drano and they burned their esophagus. Okay? In either case, the esophagus is damaged. But now they need to create some type of a bypass or communication from the oral cavity and into the stomach. So what they took was they took um, a portion of the small bowel and connected it. Okay? You guys see anything else unusual about this? Use your x-ray eyes, guys. Where is this? Is it in the inside or is it in the outside? 
Yeah, they, so it's, they put it on the outside. It's underneath their muscle, but it's on the outside of their chest. There's the chest, there's your sternum right there. That's the sternum, so it's on the outside. It's underneath the skin and muscle. Yeah. So, so you could, like, there, see your there food, might have been your a situation. Swallowing. It could have been a situation that they didn't want to. You're going to see it. They didn't want to mess, up, uh, mess with the heart because it's so close to that area right here. Interesting stuff? Mm -hmm. All right. Wrong way. Okay. Yeah. What is what happened here? Went to the bronchial. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the here we have patient aspirating the, the, the contrast. Yeah. So instead of going down the esophagus, now it went down there the trachea and into the bronchus. You think that hurts? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that hurts. Yeah, that's got to be hard to breathe. Eventually they'll cough it out, mm. but in the meanwhile you're going to have some type of uh, infection and inflammation trying to get rid of that. <laughs> okay. So patient prep for an esophagram. No prep. <coughs> okay, there is no prep because we're just looking at esophagus, which means that when I'm saying no prep, they don't have to be NPO. They can come to our department and they've had breakfast that morning. Okay, because we're just looking at the esophagus. So no prep. We're going to gown them, take everything from the waist up and off. No earrings, no bra, no body jewelry, et cetera, et cetera, no <coughs> white hair. Um, put on a gown, opening goes where? On the back side, you have a choice of using a thick or thin barium. It may be for an esophagram, it could be for a swallow study. Here, it says cotton balls. Why do we want cotton balls? Why do we want marshmallows? Because we're gonna have a roast. <laughs> foreign body. For example, fish bone. Okay? You can't see fish bone on your x-ray. If they're drinking contrast, you can't see it either because now it's opaque. They're both opaque. You can't see it. So if we dip cotton balls into barium and have them swallow it, those mini fibers are going to get stuck in the area of where that foreign body is. Now you found your fish bone. Wait, you make people swallow cotton balls? Sure. It's digestible. It's not like torture. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to poop out a sweater. <laughs> I'm like, I'll take the marshmallows. <laughs> same, same thing happens with marshmallows. You do the same thing. So in areas where a, a piece of the material gets stuck, that's a good indication of where that foreign body may be. So you're saying the scalp shot in the very beginning won't Yeah, see. you do your scalp film and you still may not see anything. But they're saying, I ate fish, I know it's there, I feel it. <laughs> yeah. Now, if, I, if that was my mom, they'll say, just suck it up. <laughs> well, what my mom used to do is she, she used to, when I used to eat, it felt like something down my throat. She gave me, like, big slices of banana. She told me, don't chew it. She goes, just swallow it. Sure. Yeah, so hopefully as the banana is going down, it's going to grab onto that fish bone and bring it down. Good old mom remedies. Huh? She was hard. My mom was hardcore. <laughs> hardcore Filipino nurse. <laughs> mom, I want to go to the hospital. No, suck it up. Eat a banana. <laughs> it worked. It worked. Yeah. All right. So you're setting up the room for a floral procedure. So you want to have all the lead. You want to have your your camera ready. Your your fluoroscopic unit. Uh, your monitors. Your lead aprons. Whoever's going to participate in this. One thing that you need to check. It's the footboard. Take off the footboard. No, don't take it off. Make you sure want to make sure it's yeah. snug, yeah. locked in. Oh. Yeah, because when that table comes up oh. and they're standing on it, <laughs> they fall. Yeah. Yes. Well, the patient that we had was laying and she was really little. Uh -huh. She was really, really old. But uh -huh. it was a, a tube, so they had to do the upper GIs with the tube. Uh -huh. Well, they moved her and they didn't warn her and she just like slid. Oh. It was yeah. Yeah. She died. <laughs> no, but I saw her eyes. No, so, okay, eyes. what I meant was did she fall off the table? No. Okay, so you guys were able to catch her. Well, what? No. No. It's, like it's like her. It's her investigation. She slid to the board. She slid to the board. She slid to the board. Okay, but she didn't slide.